Welcome back to our second Cabral House Call of the weekend, episode 1822 of the Cabral Concept. For all of today's questions, if you would like to read along, head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 1822. These are our weekend house calls where we answer all of your questions each and every Saturday and Sunday. We try to get through six questions each day. All of these have come in directly from the community. And as I always say, I like to be able to look at these with a fresh set of eyes. No research is done ahead of time. And just as if we were at a seminar and you came up to me and you said, hey, I've got this, and then go into your question, uh, this is exactly the answer I would be giving you. Some type of alternative way of looking at your issue that I hope with my just past experience and being able to work with quite a number of people will lead you down the right path for you. So thanks so much again for tuning in. Yesterday, we had so many uh, great questions as well. Many on mold toxicity, many on heavy metals. Uh, we also talked about you know, really mindset during this pandemic and how so many people are down, even a lot of health coaches and, and what we might be able to focus on instead. Uh, we talked about lower histamine probiotics. We talked about flax seeds, uh, pesticides, where to get the best foods from. So definitely check out that show. And uh, that was 1821 if you are looking for yesterday's show. All right, let's dive right into today's questions. First question is from Anonymous, and this one is coming in on 12 12. So December 12th, I know that we're running now about six weeks or so behind, pretty normal for the show. So if you asked your question before December 12th of last year, uh, it has definitely been answered. Uh, if it's after, let's say we might get to what, like 12, 13, 12, 14 today, uh, your question, if you wrote it in after that, is still coming. All right. Anonymous is up first. Uh, they say, hi, Doc. I'm all in on your Cabral concept of using the kind of medicine that will help your client the most. I'm fascinated of the osteopathic medicine philosophy. A.T. Still was the founder of osteopathic medicine, and he was a very interesting man. I think osteopathy has the same philosophy as functional medicine, Ayurveda, etc. What do you think about osteopathy, and do you think it's possible to combine it with IHP? I'm leaning towards a psychology of being Maslow at the moment. Oh, I'm reading toward a psychology of being Maslow at the moment. When I read about the self-actualization person, I always think about you. You have transformed me into a better human being. Thanks for everything. I appreciate that. It's amazing that, um, you know, that we have so many people growing on this journey, and I consider myself to be one of them. It's like who I was 12 months ago is not who I am today. I'm, I'm simply striving to be a better version of me. There is no other person I compete with. I don't know anybody else like me, and that's not a good thing or a bad thing. I'm me, uh, and and I just have to be a better version of me. And so I see there's a lot of people on that journey, and I'm very happy to hear that. And if you have no idea what the hierarchy of needs are, go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast and just type in hierarchy in the search box. You will find my um, Maslow podcast on that. Definitely worth checking out. Okay, what do I think about osteopathic medicine? I think it's fantastic. I really do. If you are looking to basically bridge the gap between conventional medicine and more like natural medicine, but still be able to take health insurance and work with people as their primary care physician, uh, becoming a DO a, instead of an MD, a DO is a doctor of osteopathy, pretty much all the same rights and privileges as an MD. Um, then it's a great field for sure. They, I also, I also think of a doctor of osteopathy as like, uh, a medical doctor also combined with a chiropractor and, and like a chiropractor mentality when they know the autonomic nervous system, they know how the bones and the movements of the body work. So um, yeah, if you want to know more about that, I would definitely look up osteopathic medicine, same uh, four-year degree, same, they, uh, they have to do residencies. So I think it can be a great degree. I mean, it really can. I know that, um, I think Dr. McCuller was an osteopath. I have a few colleagues um, that I know of who are osteopaths, and, and they do great work. And so, yeah, however you want to get into it is a great way to get into it. Uh, and yes, I think it would combine well with the integrative health practitioner uh, health coach certification. So great question. Okay. But by the way, but it's not Ayurveda, definitely not Ayurveda, a little bit of functional medicine, but more still conventional medicine based. All right, Anonymous is up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I've been working on overcoming HPA axis dysfunction and have been without a cycle post-birth control for two years. My naturopathic practitioner put me on 
fem balance by Vitanica, adrenal response, non-glandular by innate. After getting hormone blood work and finding I have very low hormones altogether, I went to an endocrinologist. They told me to stop taking those supplements and to avoid all adrenal gland extracts because these contain active hormone that tell your pituitary gland not to make ACTH and lead to atrophy of the adrenal gland cortex. Avoid licorice root because it inhibits an enzyme in the kidneys that breaks down cortisol to cortisone. How can this be true? And so many natural doctors recommend these things. Where is the disconnect? I'm not asking for medical advice, but your expert, but in your experience, who is right? Thanks again. All right, great question. And again, uh, I, you know that I can't give medical advice. There's no cures. There's no treatments given out. But here's the thing. No one has to be right. Nobody has to be right. Nobody has to be king of the hill. We need to get rid of the silver bullet mentality. We need to get rid of the ego in medicine. Your medical doctors and specialists are not right. Your naturopathic practitioner may be right depending on how they're using it. There is no, there is massive ego in conventional medicine. It's almost like there is a course taught with the degree that medical doctors, the end all, be all, don't listen to anybody else. I oftentimes feel, and again, I have a lot of colleagues that are MDs, so they are not included in this, and I have a lot of friends that are PhDs and they are not included in this. But it's like, if you didn't get your medical degree, you don't know anything. Right? And if you didn't get your PhD in something, well, you have no business even reading research. Well, that's not how it works, right? There is a, there's a middle line. Medical doctors did not go to school, certainly, to study nutritional supplements. They certainly have not studied nutrition. So let's break this down a little bit more. There's nobody has to be right. There's take away the ego. When there's no gold stars awarded, we can have general and, and nice conversations. Should you use glandular sometimes? The answer is yes. When you need to give the adrenals a rest because they are not functioning properly and there is dysfunction, you can use an adrenal glandular. Should you use it for three years? The answer is no. Medical doctors know this as well, and here's why. They prescribe a pharmaceutical drug called Cortef. What does Cortef do? it puts those adrenal glands on rest as well by giving you the hormone. What does an adrenal glandular do? Give you the hormone. So is conventional medicine right or natural health right? They're both right, except in conventional medicine, they have you use it forever because there's no long-term plan. Don't use it forever, okay? So here's the thing. We have a product called Adrenal Energy Support. And what you want to understand is we use this based on lab findings for about three to six months. And that's an appropriate time for most people. Your adrenal glands are not functioning well anyway, you allow them to rest while doing the other things in the de-stress protocol to help them to heal. Now, licorice root. Licorice root has really only been found to be an issue with people with high blood pressure. And you can look at the research on that as well. Licorice root is used for everything from viruses to mood to many other things. Should licorice, use, should licorice root be used every single day, again, for three years? The answer is no for most people. Can it be used for six weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks? The answer is yes. And we use it in our adrenal energy response product as well. I can't vouch for the other products that you use. I can only vouch for what I formulate for Equal Life because I know it works. I've read the research, used products in the past, made them better, formulated them, used them in my private practice. So I know that was a bit of a rant, but it's because everybody has to be right. Not everybody has to be right. You can allow the person that matters the most, which is the patient or the wellness client, to be the one who wins in this scenario. Okay, the next question also from Anonymous. Hi, Dr. Rawl. I'm 16 and I have been dealing with pimples for the last five years. I don't have severe acne, but I have a few pimples scattered around my entire face. A few on my forehead, cheeks, and chin area. 
It gets worse in some days and sometimes it's not, not as much. But there are always some pimples and my face is never completely clear. I've tried a lot of spot treatments and home remedies, but it doesn't take the pimples away. What should I do? I know that it's not severe, but I want to completely clear and smooth my skin. I also have blemishes, so even when there are not that much pimples on my face, I have still have blemishes that are permanently there. Some are even there for years. I don't follow any specific diet, but I'm trying to restrict sugar, but it doesn't seem to make any difference to my skin. Please help. I would sincerely appreciate any advice. Thank you. Okay. So thanks anonymous for writing in. And at 16 years old, um, a protocol that we would give to you would just be slightly different. Although I'm sure that you're at, uh, at least going through puberty, if not, you know, our, our in a fully matured state. And the reason why I say that is that, you know, a detox right around 17, 18 years old, we wouldn't want to probably do the full 21 day, but a, a seven day um, could be a, uh, appropriate. But again, it, it, under 18 years old, you really need to work with your parents and a practitioner on this. So I would certainly uh, talk with your parents, meet with one of our integrative health practitioners or a local naturopathic doctor, functional medicine doctor. One other thing, oh, I mean, here's a couple other things. I'm going to give you it all, and then you can decide what works best for you. I would run the big five labs. You could have multiple food sensitivities leading to skin rashes and acne. Run the candida metabolic and vitamins test. You could have yeast overgrowth, candida overgrowth leading to skin-based issues. You might have high level of omega-6s to a high levels of omega-3s leading to skin rashes. Um, we can check out your hormone levels. <clears throat> Excuse me. You might have high levels of estrogen, high levels of testosterone right now. Run that five to seven days before you get your period. And the last test uh, is the minerals and metals test to make sure you don't have copper toxicity or heavy metals. So, I mean, that's, if you can run the big five, if you're able to financially, that's what I would do. If you need a gut protocol, we help you with the gut protocol. If you have estrogen dominance, we help you with the estrogen dominance. If you have yeast overgrowth, we help you with that. So it's like, I can't give you the thing, um, but if I could say, you know, it's one thing, sh certainly it would be an elimination diet. And remember, even if you eliminate the food for a couple days, it might take a couple weeks on it. So don't always look for the couple day fix. Look for like, okay, let me do this for three weeks. Let me see what type of results it's getting. Because most likely, anything you put on your face is not going to be the game changer. What's happening is internal showing itself externally. All right, so, and again, if I was a betting person, which I'm not, I would say this is a gut issue as well as estrogen dominance. That would be my guess, but again, uh, not a diagnosis. Ryan's up next. Hello, I'm regularly getting close to three hours of deep sleep according to my aura ring, which as you can imagine, I'm pretty happy about. However, my REM sleep seems to struggle. Never really getting close to that two hour mark and more often maxing out at 90 minutes or so. I know both stages have different restorative functions, but can extra deep sleep make up for a lack of REM in your experience or opinion? Also, as often cited, deep sleep typically occurs is from 10 to 2. My current bedtime is around 11.45, and yet I'm still crushing it on the deep sleep. Not really a question, just an interesting observation. FYI, I take mag magnesium glycinate, glycinate and fish oil as my evening supplements. Yeah, Ryan, this is a great question. I, I love um, this field. I, I, know, I know that you probably know that, um, but you can figure this out. It's just going to take a little bit of self-experimentation. Like, is it possible for you to get to bed by 10, 10, 30 for a couple weeks straight. And then that does that then knock your deep sleep back down to let's say two hours, which is still fantastic. And then your REM's at two hours as well. You know, is it just timing? Is your room completely blacked out? What if you didn't take magnesium glycinate before bed? Would you have less deep sleep and more REM? Because it looks like your deep sleep is actually overtaking your REM sleep. And I am someone that would prefer to have two hours of both, like if, if we had to find a split. Because REM uh, sleep does different restorative processes, especially for the brain, that it does uh, than deep sleep, which is really restorative for the body as well. So you want both, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it seems like overall you're doing great, so we're kind of drawing straws in general. If you can get 90 minutes of REM, I mean, that's great. I really want it at two hours or more, and I want deep sleep at 90 minutes or more. Um, I, again, there's lots of things we could try. We could try uh, breath work before bed. We could try alternating hot, cold showers an hour before bed. We could try making sure that uh, you're doing some meditation before bed, that you're wearing blue, blue, blue blocking glasses after you know, 8 p.m., 
Uh, I mean, there's a lot that we could do, but I would love to try at least the mag glycinate and changing your sleep to a little bit earlier, even if you even if you go back to 11:45, like what if we could just do it for a couple of weeks at 10? Let's check it out. So that's what I would I would experiment with first. If it were me, that's what I would do. All right, uh, Kristen's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. Your podcasts have been so informative, and I've learned so much about my health. I've been having issues with my sleep the past few months. Had the thyroid adrenal hormone test done a few months ago, and my cortisol was high in the morning and at night and lower during the day. I also have very high estrogen and low progesterone working with my IHP. I've been taking estrogen balance, progesterone, as well as adrenal soothe, CalMag, B-complex, zinc, and a few other supplements. The progesterone seems to bother my stomach, so I've been taking it a bit at a lower dosage than recommended. In addition, I've been using the sleep support. I fall asleep at night very easy with no problem uh, between 10 and 11 at night. However, I always wake up at 3, 3.30 and 4 and can go back to sleep unless I take some melatonin, which leaves me feeling groggy the next morning. If I take it at that time, any suggestions? I'm working on completely cutting out caffeine as well, but never have it after 2 p.m. Any advice uh, you can give me will be greatly appreciated. I also have the aura ring and never meet my REM goal. Thanks so much for all you do. All right, we've got all these biohackers in the community. It's great. So, uh, Kristen, I'm really happy that you're working with an IHP and you did that um, thyroid adrenal hormone test that we call the stress hormone mood metabolism test. The IHP you're working with has you on a great protocol, so kudos to the both of you. Uh, I don't even know what kudos means, but congratulations to the both of you. <laughs> I really have no idea what kudos means. So, Okay, progestomend, you can just take it with a meal, halfway through the meal instead of taking it on an empty stomach, so don't, don't worry about that. And um, it's going to get better anyways once your cortisol levels at night get better. So you're on the right products, it looks like. Are you using the liquid melatonin? That would be my question. So two things. One, use the liquid melatonin because it probably won't make you groggy. If you're using the liquid melatonin and you take it at 3.30, uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, understood. What you might want to try then is using some L-theanine and prolonged release melatonin before bed. So that's what I would try next. And what else can I give you for advice? Well, I would try that first. And then I would make sure you're not getting a dip in blood sugar. And that's what's waking you up around 3.30, 4.30. So although I am not an advocate of eating within three hours before bed, if you try the prolonged release melatonin, if you try the breathing relaxation before bed, if you try the L-theanine, uh, do I, am I recommending? Yes, I'm recommending L-theanine. Then uh, what else would I do? And about 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams of L-theanine is the typical dose. Prolonged uh, release melatonin, typical dose is between three and six milligrams. Um, that's what I'm recommending. Yes. Oh, and then if those aren't the fix and it is a drop in low blood sugar, that's going to take some time to repair with the adrenals. Uh, you definitely don't want to do your exercise after 2 PM, uh, that you just said, and no caffeine, certainly after that time, uh, a little bit of chamomile tea or something relaxing before bed. And then you might want a little bit of a protein fat based snack before bed as well. Uh, if it's a blood sugar issue for the time being. So, that, again, not a treatment protocol, but certainly what I would do in your position myself. All right, let's get in one more question from Anonymous. Hey, Dr. Rawl, thank you for all that you do. You've helped me out so much from an overall health standpoint. I'm a 25-year-old male. I sleep eight hours a night. I eat 50% carbs, 25% protein, 25% fat, train three times a week, three to five times a week in the gym, and track my HRV and do practically everything to optimize my health. I'm considering starting a career in bodybuilding, but I also want to preserve my health and focusing on longevity. My question, how would you optimize building muscle while keeping your health optimal as well, aside from what I'm doing? Okay, so I've answered this question in various fashions many, many times, and there's two things that I want you to decide. You're 25 years old. When I was in my 20s, I weighed almost 200 pounds and I'm 5'8". Okay, so I my body was um, pretty muscular. I had a lot of muscle on my body. If you're 200 pounds and you're sub-18% body fat 
at 5'8", that, that's a good amount of muscle. It was too much muscle for my body, but it was my goals at the time, right? It was just like, hey, that's what I was into, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I learned so much from natural bodybuilding, but again, I was taking creatine, I was taking glutamine, I was eating 275 plus grams of protein every day, I was um, eating uh, four meals a day plus two shakes, you know, it was, it was gluttony to get me that big because it's not my natural body, right? So here's the thing. At some point, you decide you want to be in great shape and you want to be really healthy. And that's just a totally different story. So you can still train three to five times a week, okay? I train four times a week. And you can be lean. I maintain sub, uh, typically single-digit body fat. And, um, and I'm healthy, my weight's where it is. Will I go back to having, you know, enormous arms and, you know, <laughs> pectoral muscles and all of that? No, I probably won't, but I'm okay with that, right? But I'm also not 25 anymore. So it's like it's different phases of life, you know? Uh, so it's, it's, it's really where you want to be because to really be a great bodybuilder, you really need to eat a lot of protein. You honestly do. And then the more protein you put in your diet and the more calories you put in your diet, it automatically takes away from health because there's a certain oxidative stress-based process. And so you can't do the same level of fasting. You can't do the same level of functional medicine detox. You can, but you're never going to be a big bodybuilder. So it's kind of like you have to decide what you want. And then as a bodybuilder, if you really want to go that route, then you just have to optimize the best that you can. Like you try to still get in a 12 hour overnight fast, even though it's not as anabolic. Like I was eating right before bed when I was into natural bodybuilding because it was going to help preserve muscle. And, and you know what? It did. And it does. And I wasn't doing any, like a lot of cardio and things like that because I'm more of a hard gainer. So it took away from that. So again, it's all about your goal. It really is. Now I just want to be in great shape. That's it. I want to be healthy. I don't need to be massively muscular. I'm okay. Like I'm okay with that. So it's, it's all about your goals and, um, and that's, that's different phases of life. That's what it's all about. So thank you anonymous for writing in. I appreciate all of your questions, all of your support as always. And, uh, don't forget to tune in tomorrow. We have our mindset and motivation Monday, the best way to start the week. Take care, everyone.